So welcome back to the first case for this week of February Friday. Uh, in today's case, we're actually going to Canada. Uh, this case is actually very infamous. In fact, the woman or killer in this case is actually known as the Internet Black Widow or Can Canada's Black Widow as this um, the title of the story is called. And so let's just get right into it. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, maybe you'll get sick of being the monster out of my head, under my bed, think you're something out of my nightmares, standing right there. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, then will you get bored of killing so, of course, Melissa was born on March 16, 1935, in Brunt Church, New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, despite being from a small town, she was known for her big dreams. So, you know, wanted to leave a small town, try to make a bigger life. Um, in 1953, she would graduate from high school. In 1955, she would um, mar she met her first husband, Russell Shepard, who was a factory worker who she would have two children with. And it said between 1970 and 1985, she would go under four different names and rack up 30 charges, including fraud, forgery, impersonation, and lettering. And sometime during that time, she had left her husband, Russell, and apparently they had been married like 20-something years. What happened to her children, we don't even know. Um, in December of 1985, she would be released from prison after serving five years and returned to Prince Edward in Canada. And then in 1988, she would meet a Gordon Stewart, who was a veteran fresh out of the army and was also a widow because apparently his wife had died just a year prior. And so then rumors, of course, would go around town. A officer would even warn Gordon's brother-in-law of Melissa because he had a pension because, remember, he was in the military and apparently he served like a good 20-something years. And so he had a little pension since he had served so much time. And so in 1990, they get married in Las Vegas in America. Then they come back to Canada to have a second ceremony in Vancouver. So then Gordon would get into heavy drugs and heavy drinking, even getting arrested at least once that we know of for this. Uh, right before Christmas, he would be found foaming at the mouth. He was taken to the hospital and benzodiazepines would be found in his system. For anyone that doesn't know, that's a drug that's often used as a sedative. So obviously it's a little suspicious. Um, in 1991, Gordon would be arrested for assaulting Melissa because at this point he's pretty much caught on that this woman is trying to kill me. So then, of course, he would be released on parole, and he was told not to contact her, even though they were legally married. So, of course, Melissa would get into contact with him and ask for a second chance. So then on April um, 20th, 1991, the two got an apartment together in Dark Mouth, North Mouth, Nova Scotia, which is still in Canada. And then a week later, they would go on a drive with Gordon being heavily sedated. So you already know it's not going in good. Uh, despite this, Melissa was still trying to say that Gordon had still raped her, despite being uh, allegedly heavily sedated. And she would claim self-defense by, like, after he raped her, he apparently got out of the car and went to go pee, like, behind the car. And she said she had hit the reverse switch, like, so the car hit, the car went backwards and it hit him. And then she went forwards and basically left him there for dead. And then she, like, left the scene. And there was, like, two witnesses that were said to have seen this and actually followed her for up to five kilometers. Uh, she did not report the, she claimed was a rape until about three hours later. And then she said that she had accidentally killed him. A rape kit was, of course, done, and there was no evidence of rape at all. She still even applied for his pension, even though it was obvious that she had killed him. Whether she had gotten it or not, I couldn't even find that. Um, during this, her first divorce, so between her and Russell, was finally being finalized. And so, in 1992, she would be charged with manslaughter. and serve, She was sentenced to serve six years, but only served two. And so while in prison, she had formed a support group for abused women. And she was even featured in a documentary called When Women Can. And so she even made public appearances and set up a toll-free counseling line for women that were that were being abused. And so in April 2000, she went on a Christian retreat in Florida. Here she meets 80-year-old Robert Fred Frederick. Um, he was a retired engineer. And his wife of 53, 53 years had passed away like the year before. So there's another widow here. Uh, when she got home, she had sent a picture of herself with the letter saying that God told her that they sh they should be together. So then Robert had apparently had responded, and I don't know how quick he responded, but with her, within like three days of him and her, uh, Robert responding to Melissa, they were apparently engaged. And so on June 23rd, they were married in Nova Scotia. Uh, Robert had even asked his son for his blessing, which of course, understandably, the son felt uncomfortable. Melissa then went on a five-month honeymoon across the U.S. and a Car Car the Caribbean with a little cruise. Uh, this took about a quarter million dollars out of his savings. 
The two would then settle into a little Florida home. In March of 2001, um, Robert, Robert would have slurred words and was constantly in the hospital. Melissa was able to do this by getting two different prescriptions from two different doctors within like a month on six occasions. And then one of Robert's sons, so apparently he had more than one, one of his sons apparently had would call an elder abuse hotline on Melissa in July 2002. Uh, on December 16, 2001, Robert would sadly die from sudden cardiac arrest. No autopsy was ever done, and he was quickly crema cremated, with Melissa being the beneficiary of everything. In 2003, police in Florida would investigate Melissa on prescription fraud. In 2004, Canadian authorities would do an investigation as well. And the Florida case was dropped, apparently due to like, lack of evidence. And so at this time, Melissa was believed to have been speaking to at least 20 different men from Canada and America. And so in November 2004, she would go back to Florida by car to meet Alex and, and Alex, who apparently was 73 at the time. And on the 5th of that month, so I guess November 5th, they went to a dinner and she went back to his place basically saying, like, I don't have a place to stay. So she pretty much moved in, like, right after the first date. And so Alex apparently woke up in the middle of that night with his vision blurry. He would hit his head and was taken to the hospital. And over the next two months, he would be taken to the hospital at least eight times. So then, for some weird reason, Alex decided to sign over power of attorney to Melissa. And then Alex's son would see drugs in his blood system and $18,000 missing from Alex's account. In January of the following year, Melissa would be arrested and charged with theft, forgery, and ex exploitation. A warrant would be made for her arrest for fraud against the Canadian government between 1997 and 2003. She pled guilty to seven charges, including three charges of grand theft from a person over the age of 65, two counts of forgery, and two counts of forging documents. And somehow, through some sort of plea deal, Melissa only got five years in jail. And so then in 2009, the charges would be dropped due to lack of evidence. Melissa was released from prison that April and deported back to Canada because she was technically a Canadian citizen. She would move into an apartment for senior citizens where she promised to stay out of trouble. However, of course, we know this ain't gonna happen. Uh, four doors down from Melissa moved in a man by the name of Fred Weeks, who was 75 and a widow of about a year. So these were like recent widows that she was targeting, pretty much. And so the two would get married with sons, with Fred's son attending and his friend George. And at the time, Melissa was going on the name Millie Ann Russell. Uh, when George found out her true identity, he warned police, but nothing could be done. So pretty much he recognized her from somewhere, but he couldn't. And because her name was Millie and not, she was going under Millie and not Melissa, he like genuinely did not know. And once he realized that documentary, he went to go warn his friend. But by then, like they were already married. So of course he goes and like warns police because he's worried about his friend. And the police are like, well, technically a crime hasn't been committed yet. So there's nothing we can do. And so September 2012, Fred and Melissa spent their honeymoon in Newfoundland, Newfoundland before returning to Glasgow. They... Or at least Melissa decided to go to a bread and breakfast nearby due to not feeling well. The two would spend all day in the room. The owner would suggest going to go, go to the doctor, but Melissa said after breakfast. Cheryl, who apparently was like the owner, would call the police, uh, called the ambulance anyway. And so Fred, of course, is in the hospital and Melissa head back to Glasgow. And so the marriage was actually deemed invalid after lies would be discovered on their marriage certificate. And so then Melissa is charged with attempted murder and sentenced to three and a half years. So while in prison, she had six bo six bottles of prescription eye drops and a stash of antibiotic medicine. She will be released in March of 2016. This was under the condition that she can't access the internet, can't access drugs or alcohol, must keep police updated with where she lives, must tell the police whoever she's in a relationship with about her past. Uh, she has a curfew along with several others. And then less than a month later, she was spotted using the internet in a public library, which of course is a violation is a violation of, of the conditions of her parole. So then she was charged with breaking the terms of her release, but those charges would eventually be dropped. And so then uh, Fred, Fred Weeks, he did survive, but uh, he is allegedly said to have died January 21st, 2017. And then Alex allegedly died September 29th, 2020. So the two men who did survive Melissa, they lived to see long lives, pretty much. And so, yeah, that was pretty much the case of Canada's Black Widow. Uh, if you want to know any more Canadian cases, definitely let me know, because I don't really hear a lot of them. It's mostly United States cases. It's, you know, and so, yeah, just let me know if you find any more Canadian cases, and I'll see you with the next one. Bye!